All right, cool. Oh, look at that. We're live just like that. <laughs> I guess they, it pushes live for you. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is the e-learning hot seat. I'm here with Kenneth Chapman from D2L. Um, you know, I was as soon as I put it in my head, it left me. But you are the vice president of learning innovation advocacy over there at D2L. We've had several conversations over the years. Um, and I can say that now over the years because it's been like three or four years that we've been talking, which is fantastic. Yes, sir. Um, I work for a company called Open LMS. Just before we get started, I want to remind everybody, you're listening to the e-learning hot seat. Uh, I, you know, I encourage you, we are live right now. Uh, so Kenneth and I can uh, see your questions, see your comments, see your challenges, see your observations, whatever you'd like. Throw them in if you're listening in on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, or Facebook, just throw them in the chat. And, and uh, you know, we'd love to interact with you. Uh, I'll do some promo later, but I want to introduce you. So why don't I give you the floor? Because, you know, the last time we talked, you were, you had a different role and the time before that you had a different role and D2L was in a different <laughs> place. But what, like, what is it? Give us like, who is Ken and what do you do for D2L? Whew. Okay. That's fun. You're always an energy giving guy to talk to Steven. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this. That's great. Um, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I like to say I've been raised by wolves with an ed tech. Um, so I started working at D2L and working on uh, our Brightspace LMS while I was still an undergrad. Um, I hated the online course I was like working on. Like two years on. ago, right? Like three years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 20, 20 years ago now. Yeah, it feels <laughs> like two. Um, so I've been working with D2L uh, my entire career. I've had the opportunity to run our product development organization, product management, user-centered design, marketing strategy. Um, as we've grown, we found much smarter people to do all of those things that can produce and, and deliver and work with our customers. Um, so today I have uh, the, the privilege of being um, our front person for running our customer advisory board program. Um, so D2L works with K-12 organizations, higher ed, colleges, and corporate learning. Um, so I get to talk to leaders. I get to talk to educators. I get to talk to practitioners um, across the globe, across all of our segments. Love it. Gives me a chance to, to be a bit of a, a squeaky wheel in the organization, really rattle cages and get people thinking, you know, this is what our customer back view of things look like mm. and, um, you know, smash some of the group think that can happen within an organization. Um, I also have the privilege of talking to analysts and influencers, um, inclusive of, of folks like yourself, Stephen. Um, so the the Gartners, the Foresters, the Phil Hills of the world, the Fosways, um, really learning, you know, what are the types of trends that are, are shaping um, our markets? Um, where are there the um, opportunities for competitive advantage and things like that? Um, and what are the things that, you know, people just wish vendors knew and these analysts are great at sort of clubbing with us and helping us. Again, better understand how to be a little bit more customer back. Um, so I'm kind of a executive level ears in the market. And then when I get within the walls of D2L, a mouthpiece nice. um, to, to sort of advocate for the things that are important to our users, our stakeholders, and education in general. Well, then I want to start with the question of how disruptive has the last 24 months been for you of the pandemic? Has it, I mean leave the whole, you know, sort of the company D2L aside, you know, and we know there's been major changes there and whatnot, but I mean, just sort of how have you seen the, the online learning remote work, you know, space change and take place? And how has that really affected you? I know you're up there in Canada, you know, and, and as you, as you've looked across your global clients, um, have, is there any like two or three things that kind of stick out for you that have really been like, wow, we either didn't see this coming or of course we were prepared and we just, you know, we, we, you know, we, we delivered. Yeah, uh, I don't think we, I don't think anything, you know, really shocked us from that sense. I think what's been, um, what's been encouraging and surprising is we're coming out of the pandemic with optimism mm. and, and just how um, prolific that optimism is in all of the different people we, we speak to. You know, what we thought when we had to go online with emergency in, uh, inst instruction back in 2020. 2020. <laughs> yeah, right. <It's, laughs> When we had to do that, you know, we were kind of doing, you know, cots in a gymnasium, right? Like throwing up Zoom rooms and things like that. And we had a real concern that we were going to turn off an entire generation of educators from using any kind of technology enabled teaching um, just because of how much stress and lack of preparation and infrastructure and accessibility issues had to be dealt with right out of the gate. What's been phenomenal for us is, you know, I'll, I guess I'll take a step back, you know, being in the e-learning industry since uh, 2003, I kind of thought we'd be in flying cars of LMSs and things like that by now, right? Like, you and me like, both, brother. You and me right, both. Right, right. Yeah. It's like Jules Verne kind of stuff. And 
we didn't get there. You know, the pace wasn't as quick as we wanted to see it, all that kind of thing, you know, slow our roll, you know, follow the market. What's been really exciting about COVID is the level of sophistication that exists now in professors that we talk to, in instructional designers and CIOs and provosts is so much higher when it comes to trying to advocate for user-centered design, um, universal mm -hmm. design for learning, accessibility with a capital A, which I talk about every time I'm on with you. Um, there's a lot more willingness to lean in and collaborate and learn and um, reimagine some of those things. Mm. So I think I think there's a great chance. Um, what surprised us now is how um, productive um, our customers are starting to get around. What do we reintegrate? You know, great. We had some cots in the gymnasiums, but there's some things that worked about that. And what do we pull in and, and reimagine? So. I've, I've been impressed. I've been really inspired. I feel more energetic than ever um, working in this space just because it's that energy and that optimism is just being reflected back in in the people that are actually teaching learners every day. That is that you know, I, it's it's a refreshing opinion. It's a refreshing thing to hear, and I I hope that that also reflects with the audience that's listening now, or if you're listening, you know, to this recording because. It's just so easy to open up your news feed, whatever aggregator you use or whatever, and just see, you know, parents tearing their hair out or, or you know, teachers going out into a field and screaming, you know, because, you know, we, they, they, because you have to keep flipping back and forth between, you know, in this hybrid world and whatnot. Um, I would agree with you as well. Mostly the most of the people that, that um, you know, we've touched and that we've worked with have a, a general uh, genuine optimism for how we're coming out and how we, you know, the, the, the shape of the future, right. Especially um, uh, it, you know, in, in the higher ed space, it's really had this, this moment of, okay, we need to step up. We need to, you know, we need to level up and, and evolve, right. It's not, you know, it's not, let's go the way the dinosaur. It's like, how are we going to involve to continue not only be relevant, but just flex that muscle. Cause they, there's such extraordinary value in the higher education space. Right. I mean, you went through it. I went through, it. you know, we know it's there. It's just how we're going to continue to evolve. And then obviously in the corporate space, there's no, there's no looking back now. I mean, you know, employees are like, you know, deliver or else. So, yeah, you know, it's been like at least for, you know, knowledge in the knowledge worker space and those kinds of things. So that said, um, what have you been hearing in terms of trends, in terms of, you know, what do you, as you look for the, you know, the next six months, the next 12 months, what have you been hearing from the analysts or what does your data tell you about what do we need to be looking at? What do we need to pivot on? Uh, how do we, you know, how do we deliver even better? Yeah. Um, great question. I'll, I'll give you the, the, the D2L lens perspective mm -hmm. on that. Cause that's obviously that's, what I get. I hope so because that's what really <laughs> work. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, again, I think what's what really encourages and, and energizes me is that that emphasis on accessibility um, mm -hmm. and and really looking at not how do we fix the bugs in what we deliver to learners from an accessibility perspective, but how do we design it in upfront and design it with real goals in mind besides just simply having equitable access to the learning experience. How do we actually create and design the learning um, activities, the assessments, the evaluations? so that we can allow people to bring elements of themselves into that. You know, where do we create more of that um, um, agency uh, from the learner perspective? So I see a lot more interest from mm -hmm. organizations in, in looking at, you know, how do they rethink and readopt um, some of their, their um, learning engineering design kind of practices. Um, so for us, what that's made us really recognize is there's a role in the expertise in how to translate the pedagogical goal, you know, the teaching and learning goals into what actually moves into the technology. Mm -hmm. um, so we found we're doing a lot more of guide on the side kind of work, um, you know, doing more from having our, um, our, our own learning and creative people um, uplift and build some of the art of the possible type designs in our technology to show our customers, you know, we might have been doing these sort of things in the past. If you want to adopt a bit more of these abilities to have more project-based learning examples. You know, maybe you want to have um, a little bit more flexibility in how an individual determines um, how they show what they know and what the evaluation looks like. Here are some of the frameworks that you can leverage and, and illuminate um, in the technology itself. Um, the other big one is video. Mm. Um, you know, we're we're all so used to this type of interaction right now, right? And there's an, just an enormous amount of materials and resources are out there that aren't quite unlocked. Mm -hmm. um aren't quite Ooh, wait just, wait okay wait but unpack that a little bit for me. what do you mean like materials and resources that aren't quite unlocked what does that mean to you well for example if we're doing uh if we're doing an online lecture or a symposium right um in a, a synchronous tool 
oftentimes I don't have that as a resource after the fact, or if I do, I'm seeking through the video, watching it on two X and trying to find the right part of that. Mm. Um, it's not a searchable resource. Um, you know, if there's a, if there's slides that are demonstrated there and they're talking about the mitochondrion, I want to be able to search for the mitochondrion and go right to that part of the video. Um, you know, when people want to go and use um, media that they're creating, they have to know to caption it. Mm. They have to think about what format is this in? How are my users bandwidth going to look like? Um, what devices are they going to um, work that on? So we've been doing a lot of thinking about how do we obfuscate and remove a lot of those technology considerations from people that just want to have more of a, an interaction through video um, or to take advantage of things they've recorded in the past that can be used as a study resource um, and brought into more of an asynchronous environment in the LMS. Mm, those are those. Good. That makes sense. I wanna, yeah, it totally. It totally makes sense. Uh, and I've had so many good conversations around video recently. And um, like my, my big question for an individual like yourself, when you are talking with your user base, with when you're talking with your developers, it, how much stress is there around production value? So I, you know, one of the things that I've heard a lot is, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher, I'm a trainer, I'm a professor. I'm, a, I'm not an actor. You know, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I, I understand that I've got to tell a story, but I, you know, you've just added a layer of complexity for me, even though we know video is huge and what the adult learner of today, especially in, if you think of that chunk of, of the workforce that's out there right now, it's just expected Instagram, mm -hmm. TikTok, what they've, they have created that expectation. What have you, have you heard that same stress or, and, and what's your response to it? I, I have. And I think, um, I think there's a, a few different personas of how they experience that stress too. Um, if I, yes, that stress is real. And I think there are folks that want to have a higher production value. Um, and, and, they, they stress about it. I don't know about you, but I'm like, when I go to dump something in a PowerPoint slide, it never looks the way I want. I just feel kind of gross, right? And like magnify that by a hundred when you're trying to put yourselves out in front of students. So I think that that struggle is real. Um, I think, you know, there's a little bit of, I think the, the expectations became a little more realistic and lowered throughout the pandemic. Um, mm. You know, if, if we were doing this conversation, even at the beginning of it, I probably would have worried more about a virtual background and, and that kind of thing. Whereas I think, we all kind of saw each other's warts. We all became a little bit more human and a little bit more vulnerable in that sense. Um, so I think a lot of educators can understand that. And if they, mm -hmm. they take that mindset with their students that, you know, this is, this is uh, you know, not necessarily um, smoothly polished everything that I'm doing, but I want you to help me understand what's the best way for me to communicate this type of information. How can I bring you into the course and engage you in that sense? There's a bit of an organic way of, of embracing that, that mm. vulnerability and that, that weakness, if you will. I think the ultimate problem, though, that a lot of educators are trying to solve when they think about production value is really just lowering the cognitive load of their learners. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that they can struggle when they see really different ways of presenting information, wildly confusing information architectures. Um, and when they, that happens from course to course or instructor to instructor, that's a lot of overhead in just trying to figure out what am I trying to learn? How do I communicate my ideas and my, my uh, opinions around this? So when we th thought about production value, we thought about it more about how do we make really easy to use templates that ensure that the, the content that you're creating is gonna work on any device, you know, that it's gonna have all of the markup and stuff in place, the captioning, everything else, and then kind of accept what you can, what you can record and, and bring in from there. So, I mean, um, you know, if my production value is this this camera here, um, that's fine. But the way that it's accessed, the way that it's searchable, the way that it's um, delivered is going to be very consistent um, any time that I'm, I'm using, you know, that type of activity or a, or a media resource. Mm. So for, from our perspective, it's an easier problem to solve to, to think about cognitive load and consistency than it is that high level production value where there's lots of really great tools to do that. But I mean, you're adding that... Uh, those failure points, everything else on, on top of it. So for us, there's a, there's an 80% where, you know, you can do a lot of the, the authoring and the delivery and the, the oh, compliance. Yeah. Right? yeah. I, I agree totally. And that's, that tracks very well with the other conversations we've had. Um, I want to come back to that. I just put a pin in it right now for just a second. I want to welcome everybody who's listening to us right now. I'm with Kenneth Chapman from D2L. Um, we are watching the e-learning hot seat uh, from OpenLMS. Um, and I just want to kind of give a shout out. We do have this cool event. Again, I never remember which hand it is over here. It's called the e-learning success series. 
Uh, and and um, we've run the e-learning success summit a couple of years. And, you know, rather than having this one big event, uh, what we've decided to do is evolve it into four separate events across the year. Our first session in, in those events is coming up on February 23rd. It's called uh, the designer session. Everything, you know, we're going to be talking about everything design. So everything instructional design, you know, everything from exactly what we're talking about here. How do you put, how do you put video into your thing to, or to um, how do you use no code tools to, you know, the, what what is an instructional di designer and what's the skill set that you need in order to be successful there today? Tickets are free. Just go to elearnsuccessseries.com and um, you know dive in. Uh, Ken, uh, we were just talking, you know, so we're kind of talking about video. We're talking about production value. We're talking about the you know how do you get to that eighty percent solution? Those kinds of things. Um, I want to take that and, and talk about um, the expectations that you've heard or maybe that you're hearing right now from your clients about customization and complexity, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I've found really interesting is we've looked across our client base and we've talked with our community is there is a certain amount of commoditization within a learning management system, right? You know, there's going to be assignments, there's going to be assessment, those kinds of things. And then it's about how can I differentiate that for either my company or my school? Where 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 does that sit for you? Are, are, are you finding that um, or have you heard that that's a really important thing. Like, like, you know, look here, my in my school, we really do it different here. Or, you know, I really feel like I have this extraordinary experience. Or, it, what are what are the expectations around that? I I think more organizations are getting their heads around. Um, I guess what I would call more of a, a product management mindset towards how they deliver programs and and value to their students. And and mm. I think Stephen, for me, that's why this. That's why this optimism that maybe we are moving towards the flying cars, maybe flying cars is the wrong analogy because I think it's actually a bad idea, but whatever, <laughs> hyperloop. I don't know. I actually have a really good friend it. who's working on a flying car right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to see them in the city centers. Maybe out remote we'll fly cars. Yeah. But I think what's going to really help sustain this, this mindset towards, you know, how do we really deliver innovation and the learning experience to, to students is how savvy students and learners are as, as consumers now. Their, their expectation is that their learning experience is catching up with their digital world everywhere mm -hmm. else, right? It's built mm -hmm. around me. It's more personalized. It's meeting me where I am. It's as much a cup for me to fill with myself as it is for me to drain with knowledge, content, and, and interactions. Um, so I think with, with that in mind, um, that's going to be one of the, the, the biggest um, um, mindset changes that's happening within a, a leadership perspective. So I think what that means from a from a technology platform is what we what we've typically labeled as the LMS has really been a lot of let's build uh, an analogy of what happened in the classroom in technology, um, and when it's not really envisioned um, deeply as you know a, a more flexible way to deliver um, interactions materials in a lot of different ways, not just necessarily courses that are taught by an instructor where people go and get a grade and everybody does the same thing it affords some opportunity to think upstream about what would a universal design for learning approach look mm -hmm. like in this curriculum? How can I build up front and, and you know, use a rules-based kind of model to encapsulate some of these ways that I want to give uh, a user maybe some agency. They choose the way they want to demonstrate what they know. Um, you know, where do I give them some of those abilities to go and self-organize? Um, mm -hmm. Where do they have a, their own personal space where they can reflect on work and grow towards I'm an objective and then share it when they're they're ready for it. So it's much more of a learner centered mindset. I think where the commoditization in the LMS argument evaporates is when you look at what are some of the real operating assumptions that were made in the core architecture. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. You know, while the tools themselves may look really similar, I think how they can be remixed and, and changed is, is really powerful. One of the biggest themes I've seen um, come out of the pandemic is that the LMS isn't just seen as a, a course delivery platform anymore. Um, much, much more often, I'm having conversations with leaders that are talking about, well, we want to, we really like that idea of building empathy for our learners. So how do our professional learning and our professional development programs fit into the same environment that our students are going to be learning on? Um, we have this um, awareness that there's an opportunity for our core competency as a higher education organization to deliver quality, engaging learning content. We know industry and corporations around us are looking for upskilling and reskilling opportunities. How do we rethink and remix some of the way we credential and deliver and package um, our core expertise to go and serve that, that corporate uh, market and to build some of those connections in with industry? 
knowing people are going to be upskilling for for life now you know mm -hmm. we're not moving into 40 year careers right so I, I think it's it's those leaders that really understand there's a there's a market driven imperative to how they think about rolling out technology um, they're going to be more successful they're going to be more competitive I want to go a little deeper on that because you're, you're you stole my thunder a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> we're, no, no. We're just on the same page. Steven. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe we're just thinking about the same. I don't know. But again, several of the conversations, many of the conversations I'm having right now is that, is that bleeding, you know, that bleeding, the, the boundary between, Hey, I did my education and now I go work even in, you know, in our lifetimes, you and I, like that has been eroding kind of consistently over time. But I, I feel like even now you know, the, the acceleration of that erosion is, has been fairly stark over the last, you know, let's say 20 months here. W what are you like, go deeper a little bit for me right there where it's like uh, credentialing programs, certifications, you know, are you seeing your clients, you know, especially in the higher ed space saying, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're either we have corporate partners that we're talking with and, you know, we're bringing in these things because our, our student body is actually really sort of said, hey, look, I need to be able to show these on my resume or my LinkedIn or whatever. And yep. that's being is is that something where you can kind of plug and play, drag and drag and drop into, you know, D2L or, you know, sorry, Brightspace and whatnot in order to make those connections. Again, it, it kind of goes back to that customization of we want our institution to be you know, we're technology driven. And so we are, you know, we're, we're known for this, or maybe we're, we're really, uh, we want to stay a liberal arts university or college. And so we go that way. Right. Like, is that something you've been hearing? Yeah. And it's something that we're, we're sort of trying to, to embrace on, on a few fronts. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, we like to be agnostic and not prescriptive in terms of how an organization goes and rolls out their strategy, which means our tech has to be super flexible. So one of the ways we'll support that is we've built within Brightspace, um, a tool called course publisher. Mm. Um, and what it lets you do is you build a course within Brightspace, you use all of the kick-ass stuff that's in it. And then rather than going and um, exporting that package and dropping it into some partner organization or, or a corporation that might want to use that work, um, we can actually uh, do an LTI integration into any other um, compliant LMS. And all of the user procurement, all of the, the authentication, all of the data back and forth is managed, but the IP is still managed centrally and you've got more of a distributed model um, for delivery and more of a, a centralized area to, um, to go deliver courses. So it allows some of those, you know, loose uh, consortia that start building up um, within different states, you know, where they may have um, an organization or a school district in K-12 to that has some really top end content. They don't want to duplicate that. Um, they might want to cross pollinate that um, across different organizations. So we're, we're seeing that as one way for those, those partnerships and those, those inter interactions to get created. Um, we really recognize this, this is something that's going to be transformational in the next couple decades. Um, so we built a brand new platform, totally different from Brightspace, uh, called D2L Wave. I was just going to say, um, is this Wave? Okay. That's yeah. Wave, yeah. <laughs> so, so what D2L Wave is meant to solve for is uh, a corporation today used D2L six months ago before we got D2L Wave. We had, if an employee wanted to go and upskill, um, let's say it's you know business intelligence, um, they would go find some stuff. They do a Google search. They would talk to their manager. The manager would say, I don't know if I can do that. HR would get involved. They'd check a spreadsheet, you know, and there'd be 50 email chains. And maybe the employee went and completed the, the learning. Maybe they didn't, um, but we spent some money. Um, so what we're trying to do with D2L Wave is make it really easy for an organization to say, here are the skills that are really relevant and meaningful to the business and the outcomes the business are looking for. Here is a catalog of higher education learning providers and the, the learning offerings that they have. Um, so when I go into D2L Wave, I say, yeah, I, wanna, I want something that's less than five hours a week, but I want a, a certificate out of it or maybe a micro-credential. Um, show me what I can do for business intelligence. Um, Is that, so I, like, like, let, me, let me just interject right there. Is when you think of the adult learner, the posts sort of, let's say bachelor degree learner, how big of a ask is that when they're thinking about their 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 employment opportunity or their you know when they're when they're talking with either a future employer or a contract or whatever they're saying is the education opportunity is that like that has that's that's a big piece of the pie now like what you know what am i going to be able to do how am i going to continue to upskill that kind of stuff yeah absolutely i don't have the data on me but um i think it was a mckinsey survey it was, it was one of the top three factors for mm -hmm. um for you know more for younger um employees that are coming on with a, an organization in, in professional learning in the knowledge economy how much investment is there going to be um, in my skills and in my development? You know, what is the education as a benefit, if you will? Right. And so I'm, I'm the, the where like the the next piece of that question is, 
you know, I think about everybody who's heard the podcast right now. They, they, I've got a 13 year old kid. Right. And I just think about, he is already in this universe, right. With his, within his school. And I I've watched him, you know, yesterday I watched him build out, you know, um, uh, essentially a, a mock advertisement for you know, one of his classes. And he, I mean, this was 20 minutes where he, the video was produced, the production was done, you know, like it was uploaded, it was put in. And this is a, so how are, how are your clients and like, especially in the higher ed space? I just, I think of these uh, in the higher space, you know, agility is not the word usually that you associate with uh, higher education and, but your corporate clients as well. Uh, how are they adjusting? How are they, how are they becoming more agile? And, you know, rather than flexing the muscle, kind of doing what you were saying D2L does is like, look, let's give you a platform and we're going to facilitate uh, yeah. and support like what just sort of give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, nailed it. That's that's absolutely a, a real struggle for for a lot of organizations. And I, I mean, I've seen some do it themselves. Um, Athabasca University out in uh, Alberta here. It's uh, I think I think it's Canada's largest uh, distance education provider. Um, they basically build built a, a startup um, within their organization called Power Ed, and they staffed mm -hmm. it like a startup. They gave it a startup style mandate, and that agility and innovation is rampant within that organization. Um, so they are producing phenomenal. Um, skills-based, credential-based um, programs for direct to industry. They've built a phenomenal partner network, um, and they're not—they're leveraging on some of the infrastructure that's part of sort of the the mothership, but they're not as constrained by that, and they're they're able to fail fast and, and move quickly. Um, so that one's really interesting. I've been mm, really eager. That sounds to really that. cool. That doesn't even and, sound like a that doesn't even sound like a university. You know, that just sounds no. Like a, just, sounds like an, it sounds like an incubator essentially, right? It does. You know? It does. That's how they when you listen to them speak, they speak like that as well. But what's really interesting is they're then making a network of partners. Uh, you know, small liberal arts colleges, for example, that may have some phenomenal subject matter expertise, and they're helping them understand. We have that that um, those digital skills. You know, we understand how to unlock some of these things. Let's work together come into our sort of program, our partner network, and look at how we can create some, some reach um, and, and access students we neither of them would have been able to otherwise. So models like that, I think, are really, really interesting. And it's, you know, it, it's not a, a overly high stakes experiment. It's a small team that they have that's producing really quick. So not everybody's ready to do that um, or knows how to do that from first principles. So that's where I was talking before about that more organizations um, leaning on our expertise and from a services perspective. Mm. So we have more organizations, particularly in corporate. A lot of these services for us started in corporate, but now we're seeing them in higher education where you've got an organization saying we're building out a new program. Maybe it's non-credit. Maybe it's for you know adult learning. It's a project based, competency based education, whatever. We don't quite know how to do this properly, you know, and we're seeing more organizations go to us or other consultants and say, can you help us with a little bit of learning and creative design, help us with the pedagogy, implement some of the, the content development and, um, you know, either do it all for us and just, you know, run the whole show. Um, we see that more in corporate or show us the art of the possible, give us some of those templates, um, uplift some of our ideas and let us go and run with it. Um, mm. So we're seeing a much more uh, prol proliferation of util utilization of those types of services and Frankly, we like that. Like those are the types of things that teach us quicker than anything else. Okay, what are customers actually using and ready for? Um, and it keeps us honest as we're building product too. Mm. Where do you see? Where my mind goes there is. Um, so I'm going to take a pause. I just I, I, I keep forgetting to do this, but I'm here with Kenneth Chapman of D2L. Uh, you're listening to us live on the e-learning hot seat right now. Um, if you do have a question or you'd have a, just an observation, you want to say hello, you know, put it in there in the, in the chat and LinkedIn in Facebook and YouTube or whatever. We do see it. Even if you're listening to the recording right now, uh, Ken and I will be able to see that and we'll be able to respond as well. Um, what we were, you were just kind of talking about there is the, the done for you service, right? Rather than do it yourself services that done for you kind of stuff. Something that I've heard consistently, let's just say over the last definitely five years, but now, you know, the last two years as well is there are so many resources out there now and there's so much content out there now. Why, you know, why would a, a, either a trainer or, or, or a, um, uh, a professor, you know, build something bespoke and there's good reasons to do that, right? If you have a, a unique process in your company, obviously you're going to have to build something bespoke. Where does that fit into you? How are you connecting to like, you know, sort of content management systems or, you know, I'm thinking like the H5P, you know, sort of ecosystem or uh, other things like that. Like, is that something that's really being embraced where it's like, look, I can click and, you know, kind of, again, 
put totally. the leg, put the Legos together and then teach around it or, you know, make it kind of customize it for what my use is? Yeah, the 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 work that we get to see ourselves get into is as as probably more so than just creating the individual content assets um and and you know the the materials. Like you say, they're out there. Um, you know, maybe OERs haven't proliferated as much as either of us wanted to, but um absolutely there's a wealth of content out there. Um and and yeah, H5P, you know, other um content sources um absolutely are to be embraced. A lot of the work that we do when we're we're helping people is is how do you bring those together um, into the environment so that it's seamless from a learner um, perspective, you know, so that it's properly orchestrated with data so that we can um, make conclusions from that, gain insights, and, and build a proper engineering process around it. Um, it's not a challenge to go and harvest and organize things from all over the place. It's a challenge to make that engaging, usable. Mm. Um, and flow, right? You might have a piece of content that you want to use as part of a case study, but you want to make sure that it's really simple for people to drop into a discussion about it and to have a, a proper rubric evaluation. Um, you know, those types of things. It's it's more of the the whole flow of the learning activity beyond just the resource is what we're thinking about orchestrating um, across the platform. And that's where that's where the real differentiation and learning experience comes from. I think. Yeah, for sure. So you just touched on a subject that I, you know, we've got a little bit of time here. I want to I want to uh, dive into how and where have you seen analytics starting to be used? I mean, are, are organizations and schools really, you know, using this to their advantage? Um, let me, let me start right there. Are, have you seen an uptick in the use of analytics and sort of, you know, we've got these great tools that are saying, Hey, look, here's where the at-risk students are. Here's where the high performers are. Here's where you could do better. Have you seen an uptick in that? Um, or is that still sort of one of those things where it's like, eh, we're, we're still trying to get the learning right. I'd say we'd seen an uptick in it. I, I think we've we've definitely seen a, a downtick in the the fatigue, mm. um, and and sort of that overhyped expectation for what we were going to get from analytics. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's no black box receipt of here's the students <laughs> to go fix and what to do for each yeah. of them, and um, and I think that's good. I mean, we as a strategy rotated away from building much more you know standalone AI apps that were doing prediction to being um, more about how do we open up and make accessible and um, gain insight from some data. Mm. So we're seeing much greater usage of, of those types of tools to, to understand just some of the fundamentals. You know, what is the differences we're seeing in adoption between different programs? Um, how are our enablement attempts for um, some of the best practices we want with educators? How are they actually being um, adopted and utilized um, in different areas of the system? What factors affect student engagement? And how can I make sure that I can provide the ability for advisors um, or you know, student success coaches, whatever they're called, to have a, you know, a, a, um, a scope mm. uh, of learners that they can easily look at in the LMS and, and do so in a meaningful way without having to handpick across a million courses. So we're creating more stakeholder specific um, entry points to, to get data out of uh, D2L advisors, deans, um, like success coaches, those are things that are, are really top of mind. Um, the other thing we've done that it's just tried to encourage that culture of, of data access is um, encourage the use of our, our data tools. There's um, sort of reminders and uh, like threshold alerts. Mm. So, you know, your leaders, if you only want them to get, you know, here's this dashboard every, uh, every couple of weeks or every third one, or only when the enrollment drops to a certain level, bother this person. So it's a bit more action oriented than rather, you know, habitually come to this dashboard and drone over a whole bunch of charts every day. Um, that's where some of the the fatigue we found was coming from analytics sure. and we're trying to um, tighten up the, the process there. I, I heard you mentioned in there, uh, you know, AI and, you know, some of these apps and stuff like that. And I say it cringely as a, status, <laughs> a stati statistician, you know, it's AI. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, but, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm interested to know, like, just you as your thought and as you've been again you've been talking to leaders and and thought you know thought leaders and and clients and whatnot out there what is the thought on that about how ai is starting to creep into or is a part of the educational experience what its future potential is for personalization and those kinds of things the fears wrapped around that of you know we're just building another algorithm that's going to churn out the wrong thing uh, right what 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 kind of thoughts have you heard around that yeah, I think uh, I think the most ripe areas for AI are, are the simple things like um, caption everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, look at the computer image, uh, computer imaging um, and recognition. So, you know, if there's text um, anywhere on, on a video or an image, pull it down, use it as part of the, the alt summaries. 
being said, should just obfuscate technology should should obfuscate and hide away from humans that don't know or need to know about some of the the backend pieces. Um, I think that's where we're going to see the most proliferation of of AI and and automated tools. Um, I think that's probably the the most the safest ones mm -hmm. to to start off with. Where <laughs> I, where I personally really want to see. Um, um, innovation and, and improvement in AI is context. Mm. Um, all of the other really great examples of where you can use machine learning require an understanding of what's my learning outcome, what are my activities and my content to get there, and how am I assessing or evaluating those. Um, at some level, I need to have that kind of tr context triangle. And with that in mind, I can do a lot more to um, understand context and intelligence and make recommendations and optimize for a learner. Um, but that core central tenet a lot of educators don't have that, um, or it's in a spreadsheet, or it's inconsistent across different lenses in the organization. Um, so I think machine learning algorithms can go a long way to um, put some uh, ability for an educator to make some professional judgment based on some data-informed um, analysis. Um, not mm -hmm. necessarily black boxing things. You know, we we have an adaptive learning tool. Um, you know, people aren't quite ready to, for for that to light the world on fire and just deliver and curate all their content for them. And I get it. Um, but we can absolutely move towards those things by having some of that human judgment and expertise in the middle. Well, I think that that, that last part of your sentence right there, that's where I, what I was going to throw in there. Is, I, I love how we're discovering, again, in this process over the last two years, but you know, generally over the last 20 years, the human is still so su super important. And especially as we, as as content and platforms and whatnot become something that we're just all used to, it's it really comes back down to, you know, hey, I gravitate towards that person or that teacher or that trainer because of their particular, you know, personality or the way that they facilitate or how they've brought me in and recognize when I need some extra help. You know, that that human element is still so, so, so important. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, to, to that well, end, ahead, Susan, ahead, actually, I, another another dimension that I keep hearing added on um, in the conversation of learning platforms is. Um, I'll, I'll stop short of calling it mental health because leaders are very careful not to, but how does student wellness, how does the social emotional um, state impact the, the learning experience and, and what you know data can we glean from that dimension to serve up a learning experience that fits where an individual's mm -hmm. you know, mindset and capability are at a given time. Those are things I think are really fascinating as we're looking at how tech actually helps makes it be more human. You know? Yeah, for sure. Well, that takes me like a perfect. I want to round out this conversation with what, you know, what, what haven't I asked? What, what have you either, you know, like a, like a challenge that, you know, kind of came out of left field for you over the, you know, over the last year or so, or a trend, or maybe you're hearing from your clients that's bubbled up. Um, it's like, Hey, do this for us or stop doing that. <laughs> you know, um, like, yeah. like what are one or two of those things that, you know, again, either they don't have to be surprises, but just sort of like, wow, this really, this really has come clear, come out clear. And, um, is something you're paying attention to? Yeah, it's 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 one where it's it's uh, it's an ask from our customers, and we're we're uncomfortably excited about the challenge. I Ooh, that's a good one. I like that. Maybe that's the way I want. It. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's good. yeah, it's a stretch goal, my friends. It's a stretch goal. So, <laughs> so what we're being asked, uh, you know, if I'm doing a, an advisory board with our our provost group, for example, you know, we talk about what are things we can do to be a better partner for you to understand how to take your strategy and and make it clearer for you to how to move it forward. Um, at least when it comes to the little piece of our technology. Mm -hmm. um, and what's surprising to us is as an organization, we've always wanted to be careful that, you know, it's our customers that are, are driving and transforming the learning experience, you know, and the expertise lies with them. Um, but we're hearing more asks for be prescriptive, be prescriptive mm -hmm. with what types of insight and analysis we should be doing on data uh, and, and where we should be putting those decision points into our process. Um, be prescriptive when um, an individual educator is signaling their intent for how they want to go and deliver and what their goals are for the right way to construct and build, you know, learning activities. So to, to draw a crude analogy, Stephen, you know, I look at it as our customers are in a sense are asking us, help us move from, you know, um, machine, uh, machine, machine instructions to more of a no code environment. Mm -hmm. You know, where where we can elevate the the, the learning experience, the, the depth of the pedagogy that's that's actually implemented um, by baking it a little bit closer into the, the platform. So I think about that as much less of a, a tool and tooling sort of mindset and more of a, a conceptual model in the tech that fits what educators are looking for. So, you know, more about I want to build a case study. I don't want to 
add some content, put a discussion in there and evaluate some stuff. Mm. I, those are the kinds of things. And again, it's not the most comfortable thing in the world because you know that's not necessarily where our expertise are. But when we step back and think about it, we're talking to hundreds of customers. We know some of them are the best in the world and we're figuring out the things that work well. Um, so it's a challenge that, that we're eager to rise to, but um, it's one I think we'll you know, take baby steps towards. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Kenneth Chapman, uh, you are the vice president of innovation advocacy. Did I get that correct? Yes, sir. Fantastic. I you know that I, you know, it's titles change so often. You never know, <laughs> uh, but, but you're, you're with D2L. Um, it's always been a pleasure to speak with you. I want to ask you one final question is just you personally, like, mm -hmm. what are you psyched about for, you know, 2022? Um, is there, a shiny new object that, you know, you, you kind of been paying attention to maybe your, you know, where does augmented reality fit into the, you know, to the next couple of years. Um, but maybe there's a process or maybe there's just, and there's a cool cohort like that, uh, the university in, in, in Alberta that you said, you know, it's more of a startup. Like what, what really gives, you know, gets you up in the morning and, and you're pretty excited about to, to look forward to. You know, I, I, that's such a tough question. There's so many things I look forward to. I mean, this space, where else would you put your time and energy other than education? <laughs> um, I think, uh, I think for us, I'm really excited about the opportunity to have a much more um, open and um, attentive audience for, for us to be more, um, I don't want to say aggressive, but more assertive in trying to move forward um, some of the some of the shifts that we've wanted to see in the space for a while. So looking at universal design for learning, for example, is a, a big one for me. There's just so mm -hmm. many organizations that are demonstrating a, a willingness to adopt and embrace these concepts. I'm excited about the opportunity to go and create toolkits, um, you know, to create to go and tell the stories of some of our customers that have done this well, because I think it's an opportunity to really have that ripple effect right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I think that's why we all work in education, right? It has that ripple effect in, you know, the geography people that, that are, are people are learning in across generations. Um, I think within the institutions that are doing things that are really interesting right now, I'm excited about our role in, in this space and same as yours, right? Is to tell those stories, try to create some of that momentum for that ripple effect for other organizations to, to raise those tides. It's a great thing to be excited about. I'll put a pin in it there. I could I could talk with you for the next three hours, but I know Me people got to get on. Too. People got to get on with their work day. But uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the hot seat today. I hope that we will see you again in the very near future, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, give you Kenneth Chapman of D2L. Uh, go check him out and everything. But Ken, we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. Always a pleasure.